Uh, the title of the message, Mom's Porch Swing. And we will talk about how much that means to me. We're in Proverbs, 15th chapter, and going to be reading the first four verses. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. The tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouth of the fool gushes folly. The eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. The tongue that brings healing is a tree of life, but a deceitful tongue crushes the spirit. Thus ends the reading of God's holy word to us. Words, gosh. Words are important. A high school senior was asking his father's advice on how to woo the girl of his dreams. And his dad said, well, son, when you take her out tonight for pizza, and you're sitting across the table from her, take her hand in yours. Gaze longingly into her eyes and softly say, wow, you have a face that would make time stand still. That night, when the boy took the girl out for pizza, he sat down across the table from her. He took her hand in his, gazed into her eyes, but he was nervous. His hands were shaking, and he couldn't quite remember exactly what his father told him to say. Then, suddenly, he smiled, and he said, whoa, babe, you've got a face that would stop a clock. <laughs> Somehow, I don't think that line was going to work on her. He was trying to follow his father's advice, wasn't he? He was trying to tell her, I love you, but that's not what she heard. We know words can be a blessing and a curse. Remember, sticks and stones shall break my bones, but words will never harm me. Ah. Tell that to a child who just was told that she was stupid. Or to a teen who was mocked by his peers. Or a conscientious employer who was told that they were inept at what they do. Words are an important part of right living. The story is told of a young lady who was eagerly awaiting the arrival of her boyfriend for, for going to be their first date. And although he wasn't due to arrive for quite a while, the doorbell rang and she was still fixing her hair. And without thinking, she answered the door with her hair kind of standing all over the place, no makeup on, and wearing her favorite pair of pajamas. And when she opened the door, she found herself staring in the face of her new date. Now, the surprise kind of left her utterly embarrassed, but not defeated. She made the best of the situation by smiling and saying, well, what do you think? <laughs> and the date grinned and said gently, it looks like something beautiful is about to happen. Yes, he won some points. He won some big points from that moment on, I think. 
But then there's the other story. A time when a husband came home in the afternoon and he caught his wife with her hair up in these huge curlers. And he said to her, what happened to your hair? And the wife said, I said it. And the husband replied, if you said it, then when does it go off? <laughs> Although both stories are on the humorous side, I think only one qualifies as kind and gentle. We all know that words can devastate or delight. They can tear down or build up. Words can bring life and some can even kill. John Wesley, when he was about old, 21 years of age, and he was in Oxford University, they still have, by the way, at that university, they still have his room there. Nobody uses the room anymore. It's blocked off. But you can look and see his room, John Wesley's room. He came from a Christian home, and he was gifted. He had a keen mind, fairly good looks. Yet in those days, he was kind of a snobbish kid, sarcastic too. And one night, however, though, something happened that set in motion a change in Wesley's heart. While speaking with a porter, he discovered that this poor fellow had only one coat to his name, lived in such impoverished conditions that he didn't even have a bed to sleep in. Yet he was unusually a happy person, filled with gratitude to God. And Wesley, being immature, you know, thoughtlessly joked about the man's misfortunes. And what else do you thank God for? In kind of a touch of a sarcasm. And the porter smiled. And in the spirit of meekness replied with joy. I thank him that he has given me my life and being. A heart to love him. And above all a constant desire to serve him. Well, deeply moved, Wesley recognized that this man knew the meaning of true thankfulness. And many, many years later, in 1791, John Wesley lay on his deathbed, and he was now 88 years old. And those who gathered around him recognized how well he had learned the lesson of praising God in every circumstance. And despite Wesley's extreme weakness, he began singing the hymn, I'll praise my maker while I breath. And when my voice is lost in death, Praise shall employ my nobler powers. My days of praise shall never be passed while life and thought and being last. He knew. Now, you can't talk about the tongue without talking about gossip. And many years ago, a woman from a small town who was known now known for being a gossip, was on vacation. And she was visiting the offices of the Chicago Daily News. And she was wearing a beautiful white dress. But inadvertently, she leaned up against a wall where a freshly printed copy of the front page was hanging. It was hot and a humid day, and some of the print came off the back of her white dress. Later, as she's walking down the street to meet her husband, she noticed people walking by behind her were snickering. 
And when she reached the place where her husband was waiting for her, she asked him, is there, is there anything on my back that shouldn't be there? And as she turned around, he read the large black reversed letters, small case S, W, E, and then a capital N. And then he saw low case Y, L, A, I, capital D. Realizing the appropriateness of the words, he said, no, dear, nothing's on your back that doesn't belong there. <laughs> Daily news. Gossip can be revealing negative details about a person to deframe them. Gossip could be revealing truths about a person to deframe them. A woman once repeated a bit of gossip about a neighbor. And within a few days, the whole community knew the story. The person it concerned was deeply hurt and, he, and offended by this. Later, the woman responsible for spreading the rumor learned that it was completely untrue. She was very sorry, went to a wise old sage to find out what she could do to repair the damage. And the wise one said, yes, go to the marketplace, purchase a chicken, have it killed, then on your way home, pluck its feathers and drop them one by one along the road. Well, she was surprised by this advice. But the woman did what she was told. The next day, the wise man said, now what I want you to do, I want you to go back and collect all of those feathers that you dropped yesterday and bring them back to me. Well, the woman followed the same road, but to her dismay, the wind had blown the feathers all away. After searching for hours and hours, she returned with only three in her hand. You see, said the old sage, it's easy to drop them, but it's impossible to get them back. So it is with gossip. It doesn't take much to spread a rumor. But once you do, you can never completely undo the wrong. We need to avoid gossip. Words are powerful. Words are everywhere. According to researchers, on an average day, we open our mouths to speak 700 times, using at least 7,000 words. Now, interestingly, one study found only use about 700 words that have actual value. Now, here are seven situations when it's good to hold your tongue. One, when you're tempted to say, I told you so. Two, when you have information that makes someone look bad. Three, when someone is upset about a problem and you've had a similar experience. Four, when you're tempted to judge or criticize someone. Five, when you want to correct someone on a minor point as they tell a story. Six, when someone has not asked for your opinion. Seven, when you want to tell something about yourself in order to impress someone. If you struggle with talking too much, 
let me encourage you to build some wordless moments into your day. And that leads us to the next tongue-taming suggestion. Listen better. Someone has said the reason we've been given two ears and one mouth is so we could listen twice as much as we talk. And that brings me to my mom. Now, when I was little, I didn't have any grandfathers. Never had a grandfather in my life. They were all deceased by the time I was born. I only had one grandmother. And we didn't call her grandma or granny or yaya or hoo hoo or some of the names that I hear that grandmothers are called. No idea. We called her mom. She was Mom Davis. She was on my mother's side. Mom Davis. Just mom. And we would sit out on her porch swing when I was little and just rock and rock and talk and talk. She was so pleasant to talk to. She lived on the west side of Charleston and right near the Canal River. And at nighttime, the C&O railroad trains would be going by and It'd be so quiet, and you'd hear that train whistle blowing, and you could see the passenger car, the, all of the light in there as it's flashing across in front of you and wondering as a kid, you know, where are these, where are these people going, you know? And we would talk about everything. And then Sundays, Sunday afternoons, we would go to their house and always had a big meal on Sunday with her and the other members of the family. And one of the things I can still remember getting out of the car and smelling the what we call half runner green beans. Have any of you all ever heard of half runners? A few. They're the best green bean in the world as far as I'm concerned. And she cooked them all morning and oh my gosh, they were so good. She had a wonderful sense of humor. Wonderful sense of humor. I remember I used to call her up and I'd say, Mom, this is your best-looking grandson colony. And she'd go, well, hi, Jimmy. <laughs> every time, every time I called her, she would say the same thing. But she was so special. And I can remember hanging on her wall right by the telephone was this particular little poem that stuck with me all my life. And the poem says, A wise old owl lived in an oak. The more he heard, the less he spoke. The less he spoke, the more he heard. Why can't we be like that wise old bird? And I thought about that. And the last story, one of the last stories I remember her telling me on that porch swing, I was heading into the Navy. And um, we were sitting there on that swing, and she told me this story. She said, she said, G.H., remember this story about this little boy who had a bad temper. And his father gave him a bag of nails and he told him that every time he lost his temper to hammer a nail in the back fence. Well, the first day, the boy had driven 37 nails into the fence. Then it gradually dwindled down. And he discovered it was easier to hold his temper than to drive those nails into the fence. And finally, the day came when the boy didn't lose his temper at all. And he told his father about it, and his father suggested that the boy now pull out one nail for each day that he was able to hold his temper. 
And the days passed and the young boy was finally able to tell his father that all the nails were gone. And mom said the father took his son by the hand and, and led him to the fence. And he said, you've done well, my son, but look at the holes in the fence. The fence will never be the same. When you say things in anger, they leave a scar just like this one. You see, son. It won't matter how many times you say, I'm sorry, the wound is still there. And then I have this vivid memory of how many times Mom Davis, when I was real little, would make me stick out my tongue if she thought I was lying. And she claimed that she could tell by looking where my tongue was attached in the back of my mouth. And when I got older, of course, I realized she was just making it up. But now I realize there's great truth to that. Because our tongue is actually connected to our hearts. And what comes out of our mouths reveals what is in our hearts. Just another way to say is that our words reflect our true character.